Welcome to Books of Our Time, produced by the Massachusetts School of Law and seen nationwide. My guest today is one of the country's most knowledgeable journalists on the subjects of taxation and business. He is David K. Johnston of the New York Times. He has written a new book called Free Lunch, How the Wealthiest Americans Enrich Themselves at Government Expense and Stick You with the Bill. His book deals with the methods by which the already wealthy have used government since approximately 1980 to make themselves richer and richer, while the rest of us fall further and further behind. David K. Johnston is with me today, of course, to discuss his book. And I am Lawrence R. Valvel, the Dean of MSL. David, thank you for coming up from Rochester. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. It's the second time you've been on the show. And uh, you would have, we would have taped this a few days ago, but for the Northeastern winter, yeah. <laughs> which grounded you. David, I gather that after many years uh, of a very, uh, I think it's fair to say, a very distinguished career, uh, part, of, uh, part of it being with the New, uh, Los Angeles Times, one of the country's fine newspapers, part of it being with the, the New York Times, one of the country's fine newspapers, you are in April uh, going to... Uh, leave the New York Times for the purpose of writing books and some uh, magazine article, but basically to work on books. That, uh, is that right? Yeah, I, I've been doing this for more than 40 years. I'm not even 50 years old yet, but I've been doing it more than 40 years, and uh, it's time to go You're do... not even 50? You not even, no, I'm sorry, not even 60 not yet. Not 60, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, I want to go do uh, books full-time, uh, do some long-form magazine articles, uh, documentaries, possibly theatrical film, uh, based on the kind of work I've been doing about the disconnect yeah. between our political culture and the reality of our economy. I noticed uh, over the weekend when I watched you, I think actually about one and a half times because we T-voted, we don't have a T-vote, but we got the equivalent, uh, you and you were on C-SPAN, and uh, you, you mentioned uh, that you wanted to write, uh, write more extensively about uh, some things than you had been able to in the past or that many, and even now you said that you yourself did a lot more research into these things and into the reality of what the politicians are talking about than most uh, reporters do. Right. Um, wh wh what, what causes you, David, to uh, do some, so much more digging, so much more research, both the book kind, you do a lot of booking in, the, in your work, as well as a lot of human investigating. Why do you do that and other reporters don't? Well, you have to have lots of different kinds of reporters to make a newspaper work. You know, you need to have people who can cover sports and people who can write features, people who can write funny. Uh, very important to have people who can write funny. And when I was a young man, uh, discovered I could make more money as a teenager writing for a newspaper than anything else that was open to me. Uh, uh, one of the things I quickly learned was that there were two kinds of reporters. There were reporters who came to work and had an edit, a note in their typewriter that said, this is what you're to go do today. And there were reporters who told their editors, this is what I'm going to go do today. And I quickly decided that I'd rather be in that group. And when I would sit in meetings of city councils and school boards and things like that that I covered in my early years, I began to realize that if you started digging into how the government really operated, it was really quite interesting and that the superficial blather of the politicians, the city council members, the supervisors, or whatever, you could write fun stories about it, but the real substance was how the quality of people's lives was affected by the quality of their government, and how the distribution of resources was affected by the government. Things don't happen in a vacuum, and uh, so I took a deep interest in that, and I was also interested in the exercise of power. Uh, one of the things that I've observed through life is that, you know, some people don't care about beauty, some people don't care about money, some people don't care about power. People who care about power yeah. can do enormous damage to a society. They're yeah. very hard for journalists generally to write about. And you had to really focus on understanding exactly what people were doing and never make mistakes of any consequence if you were going to do that. And I just found it challenging and interesting. D uh, David, uh, at the risk of asking you to discuss the obvious, why is it that they're hard, hard to write about, and why is it that you must never make mistakes? Well, the first reason it's hard to write about is that uh, peop what's the point of gathering power if you can't abuse it? <laughs> Use it for your own interests, okay? But people there are not... There is none. There is none. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, people who are into power are also smart about trying to hide what they're doing to persuade you that they're really doing it for your benefit. You know, the, right. we, need to, we need to temporarily have a dictatorship because the people need this, not yes. I need this. Yes. So uh, 
you have to watch very carefully for their behavior and the acts they take and to piece them together. And there's no outside force telling you to do that. If you're writing about most news, all you have to do is accurately record the official version of events of what happened yesterday. The news media does a really good job of that. You know, what the president said yesterday, what took place in the debate in Congress, the airplane that fell out of the sky, those are all well covered. The things that are sub rosa, that are subtext, those are not nearly so well covered. Uh, and they're difficult to cover. The reason you can't make mistakes, I have watched all throughout my career, my peers, m many of them have done well, but I've watched a number of them blow up. They had some serious error in a story, or the story was fine, but when the inevitable attacks on them came, they mishandled the attacks. And so I've always been very careful about making sure that you're fair to people. And one of the ways I do that is when I'm writing a story, I imagine to myself that I'm the person who is the focus of this story. And I may be getting my skin flayed, but did I have it coming and was it fair and did I do my best to tell their version of the events, even if they won't talk to me? Yeah. Did I do my best to tell their version of the events? And those rules will generally keep you out of trouble. They won't keep you out of controversy. And I, you know, I, I can introduce you to people, Larry, who will tell you that I'm the greatest person they ever met in their life because they're not in prison for a crime they didn't commit or something else. And I can introduce you to a lot more people who will tell you I'm the biggest jerk and the worst person in the world they ever met. <laughs> Comes with the territory. Uh, David, apropos of that, let me ask you your opinion, if you're <laughs> willing to give it, uh, about a subject that has been much in the news during the 10 days before this taping. The Times did a story about John McCain. And the news media in general, starting with uh, cable television, immediamente, as they say in Spanish, if not sooner, started blasting the times for writing this story and pretending, that's my word, pretending that what the Times was writing about was a sex scandal, when it seemed to me that what the Times was writing about was hypocrisy and inconsistency, and that sex if it occurred, was only part of a much bigger picture. The Times caught its lunch for that because, of course, McCain and his people and those who support him didn't want any of this coming out. What's your opinion, if you're willing to give it, on, on who, who was right and who was accurate in terms of what the story was about? Well, I, I didn't have anything to do with that story at all, Larry. Um, I know that. <laughs> there are a couple of things I think that are, are kind of clear about it. I mean, I read it like any other reader did. Uh, one of them is uh, that the story probably would have benefited a great deal if the line had said there were a couple of staff members who believed there was something romantic, which was the phrase going on, and had pointed out that there was no evidence of this, but they believed it, and it explained their motivation as opposed to the facts. But more importantly, the story was in fact about whether uh, John McCain is how most people perceive him to be. Yeah. And in that sense, it was not unlike the stories that have been done on every other candidate, where there are these long pieces th into which an enormous amount of work that you don't see goes into these stories to examine the backgrounds and lives and activities of the candidates. And there was a lot of substance in that story. And uh, you know, the, the very morning the Times story came out, it went up on the internet the night before, the Washington Post was able to take and cobble together the material it had on the same subject and have a, a matching story the next morning. So it wasn't that others weren't looking at this. And for any candidate, comparing what you say to what you do yep. is just standard practice. Uh, uh, you know, there, there it seems to me that there's also a, an effort in this country by some people to uh, see to it that the only news you get is the official version of events. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm in the business of the unofficial version of events. Yeah. I've spent my whole career on the unofficial version of events. But uh, all across America you will see attacks on uh, news organizations for perfectly valid, well-reported stories. And many of the attacks come from people who clearly either have not read the story right. or they're being dishonest about it. And I would to cite another example, the Los Angeles Times had a very carefully reported story with women whom it named who said they had been sexually harassed by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Even though there were only named women in the story, and many of them had been reluctant to talk, they were not out seeking publicity, 
the LA Times lost something like 1% of its subscribers, and there were these massive attacks on them claiming that they were used unnamed sources. Right. People clearly who didn't read the story, and right. I think this is a troubling development in our democracy. Uh, I think you want to have newspapers that are aggressive watchdogs of government and government officials and people who exercise power. Do newspapers sometimes make mistakes or get it wrong? Sure we do. There's a reason it's called the first roughed draft of history. Yeah, yeah. But if you read the paper over a period of days, or multiple papers, which is even better, as your and my parents always did, uh, and people of that generation, you will get a pretty good picture of what the government's doing, and government is central to the quality of our lives. Yeah. Government sets the rules, and the rules define the civilization. You know, it's an example of something uh, p part of what you talked about stru strikes me as an example of something you talk about extensively in the book, which we will get to. I'm just so interested in some of the other things that you have to say also. The uh, a vast reduction in concern for honesty, accuracy, and competence. When you talk about people blasting the Los Angeles Times for using unnamed sources when its sources are named, when you talk about uh, people blasting the New York Times for allegedly writing an article about unproven sex when it's really about inconsistency and hypocrisy, you're just talking about people who don't give a tinker's damn about honesty or accuracy. Well, there actually are some people, I believe, who are essentially paid to manufacture ways to attack the news media. Uh, one of the, the salient things I think we've seen happen in this country is a rise, of the, in, in, a rise largely among the people who call themselves conservatives of being statists. Uh, yeah. The other day I was watching a program on Fox News where, where the uh, anchor referred to the Republicans as we. Um, <laughs> I noticed nobody wrote a piece about that. Imagine if, if oh, Dan yes. Rather, and I don't know what party is in, but had referred to one part or the other and said we. Um, God forbid but, it should have been we Democrats. Oh but, my God. But the, the thrust of the point being made was that someone had um, the government had, uh, uh, the British government had asked that something not be reported, and some journalist somewhere had reported this. And it, the thrust of it was, well, you know, you weren't being patriotic. You weren't silent when the government told you to. Yeah. Well, that's not my version uh, understanding of the idea of patriotism. That doesn't mean this may or may not have been a mistake to do, but the First Amendment was adopted at a time when newspapers had no regard for facts. They were, in fact, made things up. Uh, uh, John Adams was accused of all sorts of horrible crimes, for example, that uh, he never committed in misconduct. And yet they passed the First Amendment. They adopted the idea that having a robust public discussion would advance this, at the time, radical idea yeah. that we could govern ourselves. Yeah. You know, you live over the, if you're a journalist, you sign all your work. There's a, a saying in my business, uh, lawyers say their mistakes off to jail, doctors bury theirs, only reporters sign theirs on the front page for everyone to read. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. the only thing you have to sell is your reputation about that. Yeah, and over yeah. the long haul, uh, your reputation will stand or fall. But this notion that you should bow down before the government, that you should not report things, that we should allow courts to seal records and conduct Terrible. government in private, that we should say, we're going to give money to this or that party, but you can't know how much of your tax dollars were spent or how because of confidential business reasons. That should be deeply offensive, I would think, to people who understand the theory of why we created America. Yeah. Well, you know, and you can extend that, and on other shows I have and we will in the future, to executive privilege and the state secret privilege. People in power don't, and in fact, it's true in corporations, it's true in uh, universities, in police, it's true everywhere. People don't want you to know what they're doing because... It won't, you know the old saying, David, if you don't want to see it on the, fr uh, if you think you wouldn't want to see it on the front page of the New York Times, don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah, yeah. well, they do it, but they still don't want to see it on the front page of the New York Times. And this attack, uh, uh, attacking uh, journalists, this goes back, well, it goes back, of course, as you say, to the uh, 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 1790. Jefferson actually paid some guy. I forgot the, it wasn't for no, it was the other guy. He has to paid some guy to go out and attack the administration of which he was a part. He did it well, secretly. And, and we had the Alien and Sedition Acts at yeah. one time. Uh, well, we used to have commercial uh, uh, criminal libel laws. We've gotten rid of those. Yeah. But the, 
it seems to me that you need to have journalists who do many different things. Yeah. You need to cover sports, you need to have funny stories, but you need to have a significant core of journalists whose job is to be skeptical about the government's operations, to tell you not what the politicians say, but what the government actually is doing. Yeah. And we will be better off in the long run, I believe, if we do that because it's a funny thing. Truth tends to lead to better policies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, David, I'm not going to ask you to comment on what I'm going to say because uh, I don't think it would be fair to ask you to comment. Uh, but then I will ask you something in which I will ask you to comment. I, I think that Bill Keller and Arthur Salzberg are incompetent. When, uh, oh, I don't agree with you about that at all. Okay. Uh, uh, let, yeah. let, me, let me tell you my, re my, la my latest reason, if I may put it that way. When, when the story about <coughs> McCain came out, Keller published some kind of statement that the Titans had gone through many drafts and it was the usual way and this is what always happens and they uh, printed it when it was ready. Well, and that's the kind of stuff he talked about with regard, for example, to the breaking of the news about the N uh, NSA spying, which they actually sat on for one year. Uh, it would have had a dramatic impact possibly on the election had they not done that, but be that as it may. But he didn't say word one about in this last time. He did not say word one about what you and I have been talking about, which is this wasn't about sex. This was about inconsistency and acting contrary to what well, you've been preaching. Okay. I, you know, I'm not a spokesperson for the Times, okay? But as an individual and somebody who's been in the top ranks of journalism as a reporter for a long time, the most important person in a newspaper, if you're a reporter, is not the editor, it's the publisher. Yeah. If the publisher doesn't have any spine or backbone, then you don't get things in the paper. And, and I worked at the Los Angeles Times when Otis Chandler was there, and the editors would go say, we're going to run this story tomorrow, and he would say thank you, and they ran whatever they felt they needed to run. And I worked there afterwards when publishers sort of went, uh, yeah. And this self-censorship came into the paper, and it was very damaging. Uh, and I was the, the first person to leave over that kind of nonsense. About two dozen of us eventually left. <coughs> um, uh, Arthur is faced in a very tough environment. This isn't the nice, easy profits era of the past for newspapers where they were printing money. They've been enormously successful at moving towards the Internet, the size of the audience, uh, the influence of the Times. And up until just recently, while everybody else has been cutting, they were uh, adding to the staff. Um, uh, Bill, who uh, has been running the paper now since the short, brief, unhappy reign of Howell Reigns, has had to make a lot of tough choices. But for example, in the story you mentioned on national security, which I know nothing about except as a reader, I do know from my experience that editors all the time say to reporters, you don't have it. You think you have it, you don't have it. Just like prosecutors say to detectives, you don't have it yet. Go back and do more work. And in that case, my recollection is the reporter took a leave to write a book. And during the course of that, developed more material, and then they felt you had it. You don't publish a story till you think it's ready. I've many times thought I had a story ready to go, and I am very glad now that some editor said, I put the hoop up here, you haven't jumped through it yet, go back and do more work. So, I, 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 and I've never met an editor I had any respect for who would time a story or care about the election. We run the story when we run the story. We don't say, oh, we need to get this in print. There are certain events that are coming up. If you're going to write about the 50th anniversary of something, you better have it there by the 50th anniversary. Uh, but for almost all news stories, it's when you're ready to go, you go with it. And by the way, they published the story. Nobody else published that story. And we now know it was right on. We, we, we will gentlemanly like agree to disagree on that particular story. And, you know, I have to say that I, I think the Times, and one of the reasons I get so angry about what I see as big mistakes, what I see as big mistakes, obviously not everybody sees it my way, viz what you've just said, is that I think the Times is a national treasure. And, you know. There's no other newspaper in its league. I've worked for five big papers, the San Jose Mercury, the Detroit Free Press, the LA Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the New York Times, and I have good friends at the other top papers in this country. And the Times is in the league by itself. I believe the Times is absolutely vital if we're going to maintain the liberties of the people yeah. as a check on the abuse of power by government. You know, that's a very strong statement. Uh, I agree with it. I, I, I think it's, it's almost a criminal shame that we are at the, a point in this country where if a single newspaper were to, be, to go down, 
or if its people are to be uh, affected by the pressure that's put on them all the time, it just means that our democracy could be in ever bigger trouble. We have a single lifeline. If you ask me, this is a very bad thing. Well, yeah. I mean, there are other forces at work, but among newspapers, you know, a lot of people look at the world as they're born into it and assume, like Dr. Pangloss, that it must needs be that this is the way God yeah. intended the world to be. It is nowhere written down that we will have our liberties, that we will have the freedoms that we have come to know. And there is a never-ending struggle against the need for the state to be strong enough to be functional and to have a civilized society, and at the same time, its desire to crush those who stand in the way. Prior to our Constitution and Bill of Rights, I think the historic problem for the inconvenient individual was predation by the state. Yeah. The king doesn't like you, throw him in Chateau d'If. The king wants your daughter when she's a virgin, you don't want to hand her over, cut the guy's throat. And one of the great geniuses of, of our Constitution was the recognition that the liberties of the people depended on a certain set of standards, habeas corpus being a crucial one the ability to speak your mind, the ability to follow or not follow religion as you chose. And that when we put these in place, we have this flourishing society. It's not perfect. We've got lots of things wrong in our society. Government has problems. I spent my whole life writing about what's wrong with government. But there is no civilization. There is no liberty without government. And to the extent that people have said, well, I don't care what the government's doing. You know, I'm much more interested in, you know, did Brittany get drunk last night? Who is Paris sleeping with this week? and not with what the government's doing, then politicians fall under the influence of other people. In, in, our, in our age, they have fallen heavily under the influence of their donors because of gerrymandered districts that, now this year is an exception, but historically only about eight congressional districts per election have been competitive in your and my lifetime as adults. And therefore, the real constituency of members of Congress are the political donors, and we've seen how money brokers and efforts at campaign finance reform have made things worse and worse and worse so that we have a government that is increasingly estranged from the needs of the people and focused on the needs of the moneyed people and large corporations. Uh, and, that, and that's the area I have been working on for years and, yeah. and part of the reason I'm going to go work on books and things is because yeah. I want to do things that are beyond the scope of the daily newspaper. Yeah. Good as it is and important as it is, I want to explore things on a level that's beyond the scope of even a great newspaper like the New York Times. Well, now, that is what <laughs> free lunch is all about. I think that while free lunch, which is, what, 370 pages, whatever it is? 320, I think. 320. Well, maybe uh, 319 and a half are about ways in which the wealthy have, since about 1980, used government, as in the Gilded Age of the 19th century, to get richer and richer, while the poor and the middle class, everybody but the top 1%, essentially, you know, struggle on uh, at about the same level we were at in 1980. While maybe 319 and a half pages are about that, there's a half a page which really resonates with me. This book is because it makes a point clear that I think is implicit in the rest of the book. This book is really a book about morality, isn't it? Oh, sure, yes. One of the criticisms I've actually gotten is, you're a reporter, what are you doing writing with a moral tone? And yes, this is a book about political culture and, and morality. I cite the Adam Smith, the Bible, and Andrew Mellon as moral authorities in this book. All throughout the Bible. The Everybody old, will go with the first two, I don't know about the third. <coughs> well, it's, I think it's important that, the, that Andrew yes, Mellon- Yes, I understand. Yes. Andrew Mellon says that, People are more important than capital, and people have to be thought of first, not capital, because that's not our culture today. All throughout the Bible, the most frequently denounced evil is taking from the poor to give to the rich. The Bible tells us in, in both books uh, that your society will come to ruin if you do this. Now, it was written at a time when we didn't know how to create wealth. Remember, Balzac said 200 years ago that behind every great fortune lies a crime. I know, it's a but great we, comment. But we know how to create wealth now. The Industrial yeah. Revolution created wealth. The Information Revolution and our ability to manipulate cyberspace and to develop concepts and structures in mathematics and elsewhere, we can create real wealth. So, per se, being wealthy is, is now not the result of taking from those with less. And yet this historic problem has come roaring back. And 
it's come roaring back under the guise of conservatism. Conservatism to me means we take the things that we know work and we keep them and we maintain them. And if you want to try something new, you want some new government program or policy, you're careful about it, you're cautious about it, you're skeptical of it. If it turns out it works, we'll try incorporating that. But we have a great skepticism about doing that. Well, that's not what we got. We got radical ideas that no one else in the world is doing. And lo and behold, these other countries are having fewer problems and their middle class is better off because they didn't do these radical things. They were, in fact, conservative. Now, the things they did we might view as liberal, but they were conservative in hanging on to those things. And so what were we promised in 1980 when Ronald Reagan asked his famous question, are you better off than you were four years ago? And I'm here asking the question, are you better off than you were in 1980? <clears throat> he said, we'll have less taxes. Well, you know what? Taxes as a share of the economy are the same they were back then. Government spending as a share of the economy hasn't changed one iota. Except what it's we've, higher, absolutely. Well, what we've got, it, it, but not as a share of the economy. I understand. And understand. what we've gotten instead is all this government debt. So that now, if assuming that all the federal, the interest on the federal debt is paid just from the individual income tax, all the income taxes that you pay from January through the end of April just go to pay interest on the national debt. And since 86% of federal tax revenues come from labor and 14% from capital, that means we explicitly have a policy now to tax labor to transfer to capital. All right? Or to so, China. Or to, or to, well, but, but China's capital. Yeah. Right. So we didn't get less government that we were promised. Next, we were told uh, we should have deregulation. There's no such thing as deregulation. Everything has rules. You have rules here at the law school. Students have to follow. There are rules on how many, on what size and shape a, a, a stop sign has to be. Uh, baseball has rules right down to how many stitches there are on the baseball. What we got were new regulations. And the new regulations were written by Enron and the railroads and the banks. And they eliminated consumer protections or reduced them. They took away enforcement of the existing laws. They benefited this political donor class who were pursuing their own self-interest. And by the way, I don't have any problem with people pursuing their own self-interest. It's just there's not been a pushback from the rest of society as we have seen unions which help push back decline and other uh, areas where there was pushback decline. Uh, big churches, some of them were involved in this and, and uh, we've seen them decline. Um, we were promised that we would have, uh, that markets would provide solutions. Well, you know, a lot of my book is a defense of markets. The Supreme Court says a market is where uh, independent parties, neither uh, under uh, duress or coercion, and with knowledge of the facts, come to an agreement on a price. That's not what a lot of our new markets do. We now have markets designed to thwart competition, to take Andrew Adam Smith's invisible hand of the market that in which there are lots of, of sellers and smart consumers who can compare prices and this drives prices down, Adam Smith said, to the lowest level at which businesses can continue to operate. We've replaced that through government policies with practices that artificially restrict competition, that raise prices, that inflate profits, all under the guise of conservatism and, and markets will solve our problems. Fundamentally, I argue in free lunch, what's happened is that a narrow segment of our society, large corporations, which are immortal and amoral, right. they're, 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 they're necessary, they're important, they're great producers of wealth, but there's reasons that you want to regulate and control entities that are both amoral, their purpose is to maximize return to capital, which is a perfectly good thing to do, but they have no other obligation. And they are immortal. Unless they mess up in the marketplace, they go on forever. Unlike you and I, who our time's going to run out someday. Um, if we Not don't, soon, I hope. I, one hopes. <laughs> um, uh, unless we have rules that govern their conduct, they can do enormous damage to our society. And, and we have had a massive effort to collect subsidies from the government, to get rid of government employees and replace them with private sector workers who typically cost twice as much. So the federal workforce has gone down, and, and you, everybody's seen news stories that the federal workforce is shrinking, but the number of people who are paid by the federal government to work is going up, and the cost per person, per labor hour, is going up enormously. And when we do that, by the way, unlike 
creating a bureaucracy where, you know, empire building bureaucrats. Now you have a corporation that makes campaign contributions to encourage more of this and more contracts and more money flowing their direction. So all of the things we were promised, most of them haven't happened. Well, there have been some good things. You know, airfares have fallen. We have a lot more air traffic than we used to have. There have been some benefits. It is not black and white. But my focus is on these areas where we now have massive transfers of wealth and income from those with less to the politically connected few. Can billions I, and billions of dollars being handed up the a ladder. You know, David, it strikes me, as you were talking, a couple of ideas struck me for the first time. What you're discussing is not different, is it, than what was happening in the uh, Great Britain against which the founders of this country rebelled because monopolies, the East India Company, there were monopolies that Britain, uh, they even let them have private armies, uh, which the East India Company had. In fact, the East India Company, uh, Larry, is actually fundamental to the American Revolution and is taught the wrong way in American schools. And anybody who's a school teacher, I hope you listen to this. There's a wonderful book called The Boston Tea Party by Professor Larrabee. It was, came out 40 some years ago, where he went and got the British records of this event and the American records. Uh, every school child in America gets told, I'm sure you did as I did as a child, told this was a protest against high taxes. No, it wasn't. It was a protest against a tax exemption. Sure. It was a protest against a favor, a government tax sure. favor, to the politically connected friends of King George who owned this royal monopoly, the East India Company. They mismanaged it because guess what? In a competitive environment, managers who can't run the business are gotten rid of or they go out of business. But in a monopoly, you can mismanage for a long time, and the same thing with a duopoly and an oligopoly where there's a little scintilla of competition among a few firms. And they were going to go bankrupt because they had all this tea that they couldn't sell, and they were going to replace a market. In Boston, uh, not far from where we are, um, uh, I think it was seven out of ten cups of tea drunk in uh, uh, November and December of 1773 were Dutch tea. But under this law that was being protested, there would be a monopoly and only British tea could be drunk. Well, people understood that that would eventually mean higher prices, that it would mean less competition. There were lots of little petty merchants who depended on selling tea to make their livelihood at the time. And if we have such a fundamental misunderstanding of how the country got started, then we're going to have fundamentally flawed policies that flow out of these myths. And a lot of what I've been writing about in Free Lunch and my book Perfectly Legal and the 13 years of stories I've been doing in the New York Times are about what I see as a growing disconnect between our political and cultural mythology and yeah. how the economy yeah. actually works. Yeah. Now, all societies have to operate from myths. You have to have a shorthand for your culture. But ours is getting disconnected from reality. And uh, I believe one of the reasons that Free Lunch has done so well in the two months it's been out is that a lot of people have looked around after 28 years from when they were promised all these things by Ronald Reagan looked at their circumstances, realized that for the bottom 90% of Americans, incomes are unchanged after 28 years, even though the country is more than twice as wealthy in real terms, and productivity per capita is uh, uh, up 70%. For every dollar the economy put out back then per person in real terms, it puts out a dollar and 70 cents today. And they've said, where's the beef? Right. Right. And that disconnect is, uh, I'm hoping, opening up an opportunity to get people to see what the government has done that's contrary to their interest. Because yeah. Adam Smith said, any policy that benefits the majority of people must be a good thing for the society. Uh, David, uh, you've just, you know, uh, over the last 10 minutes, you've actually presented a fair amount of your book, which it'll become more evident to people as we go along that you have done that, that you've summarized a lot of it very well. I'm going to go, uh, and it seems that every time I bring up a historical point that it gives you another shot at doing it. I'm going to bring up another historical point. Okay. Isn't, uh, you, you say in the book, I believe, and I think I heard you say on television, that what we have is a social system or an economic system that uh, in reverse of the biblical, takes from the many or from the poor to give to the rich. Now, isn't that exactly one of the major reasons for the French Revolution? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, what happened in France, only determinant of your economic life in 18th century France was how well you picked your parents. 
uh, trusts and estates and the functional equivalent of what would happen if we repeal the estate tax in the United States occurred in that all capital and all land, and this was essentially an agrarian society, were tied up. Either the church or trusts controlled so much that there was no movement anywhere. One of the stories I tell in Free Lunch when I talk about the hedge fund business in the United States and uh, the hedge fund managers who pay taxes at the same rate as janitors in the United States. Uh, janitors don't pay that much. 15% uh, tax rate. I mean, don't pay rate. that little. Right. They pay a 15% tax rate on their incomes, and that's what hedge fund managers say they should be able to pay. Yeah, we, there was some guy who made $1.7 billion. Yes. He made Michael Milken look like a piker. Yes. Well, the, the, the average hedge fund manager in 2006, well, remember the hedge fund managers keep telling us if you raise our taxes, the whole economy will, will be yeah. negatively affected, uh, said that it was not fair to make them pay more than a 15% rate. Of course, you know, school teachers and reporters tend to pay 25 or 31%. Well-to-do Americans pay 35%. Um, uh, and you know, the, the top 25 hedge fund managers' average income was only $11 million. Oh, I, I'm sorry, $11 million a week. A week. A week. But they can't afford the taxes. Um, the, the, That's a uh, cool 650 a year. The, the, there, is a, <laughs> there, is in, uh, uh, there is a model of the La Petite, La Petite Trinon, uh, which was Madame Pompadour's residence and later briefly Marie Antoinette's in Greenwich, Connecticut. And at the time the original was built, uh, there was a room built so that the, 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 the royals would not have to be seen in the presence of their servants. Mm -hmm. The table was to be laid out on the ground floor by the servants and then a mechanism was, in, was to raise it up into the room where the royals could have their party and dinner and whatnot. And then it would be lowered back down. Uh, before the mechanism could be built, uh, a revolution intervened. Well, <laughs> if you if you, How go, unfortunate. <laughs> if you go now to uh, the big stadiums where we are subsidizing commercial sports, two billion dollars a year taxpayer subsidies to baseball, basketball, football, and hockey. All the new facilities have these uh, luxury boxes. Most of them are uh, owned by companies. Almost all of them are, which ha tax deduct the expense. You want to buy a ticket to a baseball game, you pay with your after-tax dollar. People in the luxury boxes, this is a business expense because they're entertaining clients. And so you're subsidizing this because they're getting a deduction. And guess what? The subsidy payments that you're making for these new stadiums are being used also to create private walkways so that the wealthy who go to these boxes don't have to mingle with the likes of you and me. And we're the ones who are putting up the money so they don't have to be with us. This strikes me as not particularly egalitarian or democratic and much more like the French government of the Sun King. When one talks to people about what's going on in their own society at the time, they don't want to hear it because it hits too close to home or it destroys their mythology or whatever reason. When you bring it out, oh, this is what happened 200 years ago, they want to hear that and maybe that's a way of opening their minds. So let me add that if I understand this correctly, I think back in the days of uh, the French Revolution, Louis the Sixteenth, wasn't it, was borrowing like mad to finance this, that, and the other. And how do they pay for the borrowing? Why they tax the peasants who didn't even have any bread? Well, uh, yes, and you know, if, uh, the most widely read uh, literature in Western civilization is Jane Austen, and her stories are about these young women from families that are going to come to the end because there are no sons, and the daughters have to find husbands under that culture. Uh, or they face an awful life. There are these men that they're looking at, these young men, oh, Mr. Darcy has 10,000, Mr. So-and-so has 5,000. And what they're talking about is actually the British finance system in the 1700s and the 1800s, where wealthy people loaned, their, uh, loaned large amounts to the crown and were paid interest. That's what the 10,000 is. And of course, whatever money they could make off their, their farm and whatnot would supplement this. But they had this cash income from the crown. And all the crown had to do then was raise enough taxes from the poor and the, the middle class to the extent there was one to pay the interest. Well, what have we been doing since 1980? Ronald Reagan came in saying he wanted a balanced budget. We last had a balanced budget under Richard Nixon. Um, <clears throat> we have seen budget deficits grow enormously over the years to the point where the federal debt, uh, not adjusted for inflation, was just under a trillion dollars when Ronald Reagan came into office. And by the time George Bush leaves, it will be $10 trillion. Hmm. And so this enormous amount of money, four, over $400 billion a year, is just going to pay interest on the national debt. That means it's money we don't have for uh, 
higher education for infrastructure improvements so we don't have bridges collapse and kill people in Minnesota when they're commuting home from work so we don't have pinch points that are costing us billions and billions of dollars because we can't efficiently move goods around the country. We don't have it for all sorts of things that would grease the wheels of commerce and make us wealthier. And this practice of borrowing is a practice that in the long run will make us less wealthy. Um, the practice of spending money we don't have inherently in the long run has to make you less wealthy unless you're spending it for things that add value to your society. So if you're borrowing to build the Erie Canal, which yeah. means wheat grown in Iowa can now go to New York and will also mean the end of the wheat business in Rochester, New York, where I live, and new, new development will have to come along. If you're borrowing to build the Erie Canal, the interstate highway system, to uh, educate young people so that their productive minds will make more value in the future, you're making an investment in the future. That's not what we're doing with our borrowing. Yeah. We're, with our borrowing, simply spending money we don't have today. And that we are in transferring enormous amounts of money to big corporations and wealthy individuals. I mean, we, we gave, um, as taxpayers, we gave one of Warren Buffett's companies in 2006 an interest-free loan of $665 million, and we only asked to pay half of it back 28 years from now. Now think about that for a moment. Imagine, Larry, that you bought a house in 1980 and the price of 1980. And up until now, you hadn't made any payments on the house. And this year, you've got to pay half in the dollar, number of dollars you agreed to back then. No adjustment for inflation. You think that alone might make you a wealthy man? I would hope. Yeah, you would hope. Yeah. We gave Warren Buffett, another one of his companies, a $100 million gift last year. In fact, the state of New York had to create a special district in Erie County where Buffalo is. Now, the justification for this is that Buffalo has the highest unemployment of the cities in New York State. And this would create jobs. It was a call center for Geico Insurance, the one that has the cavemen and the lizard. <laughs> well, first of all, a competitor closed down their call center, so there were no new jobs created. And significantly, they didn't create this job center in downtown Buffalo, where the unemployment is. They created one of the whitest, wealthiest suburbs where there's virtually no public transportation. Yeah. Again, transferring money up the chain of command, benefiting who? The second wealthiest man in America. There's more. Warren Buffett controls an electric utility that has operations in the Midwest, uh, Utah, and uh, Oregon. Oregon passed a law saying whatever income taxes are embedded in the electric rates paid to this monopoly electric company must be paid to the government or the ratepayers get the money back. Warren Buffett's fighting that like mad because he knows that that company can permanently capture those taxes if they're very smart about how they handle their finances and enhance their profits. In Iowa... You mean by capture, you mean the money that should go to the government will instead remain with the company? With the company forever. And in fact, uh, Enron, which did not pay taxes, I broke that story about, I think seven or eight years ago, uh, owned uh, Portland General Electric in Portland, Oregon. And people paid close to a billion dollars in their electric rates to cover its taxes, money that never got to the government. Buffett owns... Uh, the, you create uh, shells and subsidiaries. And buy and tax shelters yeah. and do other devices. Uh, when I wrote a story about this on the front page of the New York Times, the Edison Electric Institute wrote a letter, as I expected they would complain. They didn't say this wasn't true. They just said, we're just doing what the law allows. But now uh, there's one more element to this. Uh, Buffett's electric company in Iowa. There used to be nine corporate-owned utilities, electric utilities in Iowa. They were rolled up into two. The people in Johnson City, which is a manufacturing town, and five or six little neighboring communities got together and said, we want lower electric rates. You've consolidated. Rates should go down. No way, said the company. So they started organizing to buy out Warren Buffett's company and have municipal power. Everywhere in America that you have municipal power, it's cheaper than corporate power. Pretty soon, they got advice and recommendations and help from the Iowa Association of Municipal Utilities. There are, I think, nine little city-owned electric systems. And one day, a guy named Bob Haug, who is the executive director of the, this association of municipal utilities, was invited to the state capitol in Des Moines two prominent Republican legislators sat him down and they said to him that they had a bill, a bill that would tax these municipal power agencies and would hamstring them from any change in their business model whatsoever in the future, and that unless they promised to never again help people try to buy out Mr. Buffett's company, they had the votes to get this enacted. 
or as Carol Spaziani, the retired city librarian in Johnson City and one of the organizers of this drive said, you know, I turn on the television and here are these images and these news stories about this beneficent billionaire, Warren Buffett, who is giving away all of this money. What nobody writes about is how he's gouging the people of Johnson City with excessive electricity rates, and that's how he's making his money. Now, David, let me ask you a question. Yeah. I'm going to go back to something we talked about a while ago. You, 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 in the course of this discussion, this most recent discussion, you said that some article had been on the front page, and then you also said that this, this Iowa problem had not been written about. And something you said at lunch really uh, resonated with me. Uh, you pointed uh, out some of your own stories that had been, I will use the word relegated, that's the word usually used, to Section B of the New York Times. Or buried inside the paper, yeah. Yeah, okay. I was trying to be nice. Relegated. <laughs> yeah, buried. Okay. Um, and these are important stories. And you say that uh, when you uh, asked the Times, well, why, why, did you put it, why didn't you put it on the front page? You said, well, you've written about that before. That's old news. Now, here's my question. Isn't it true that every day the front pages of the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, every bloody newspaper in the country is filled with repetition? I don't even read the first 25 pages of the Times anymore because I've read it since 1966. I've read the same stuff. Well, Larry, I'll never think of you as a guy who throws softball questions. Um, <laughs> first of all, all reporters think their story should run on the front page. Yeah, okay? We all think that. Of course. And editors are the ones who decide. Um, and there are times when I've had stories of mine on the front page I didn't think belonged there, but the editors thought that. I have written I exhaustively in the New York Times about what's happening to incomes in America. That Incomes at the very top are pulling away from everybody else. And we're talking about the top, basically the top tenth of 1% and above. And their incomes are exploding. And in free lunch, are, there are lots of numbers about showing how this happens. Um, and the bottom is falling out. They're dropping, and the middle class is stagnant. Uh, so yes, editors put the particular story that I did uh, inside the paper. This one s showed that from 2003 to 2005, the increase in incomes to the top 1%, just the increase, was greater than the total income of the bottom 20%, who are the poor. Uh, in fact, for every dollar the poor had in total income, the increase to the top 1% was about $1.37. And this, although it's short-term data, it reflects this tremendous uh, change that's taking place. Now, when incomes fell after 2000, uh, was the people at the very top who took the biggest drop, um, as, as I reported. And uh, in 2005, the average income in the United States was still smaller than 2000. That's something that's never happened since World War II. It should be telling us something about whether our policies are working or not. Some people in 2005 had higher incomes than they did in 2000. They're the people who make over $100,000 a year. And half of the increase went to people who make over a million dollars a year. So the bottom 90% of Americans had smaller incomes. The top roughly 10% had larger incomes, tiny bit larger for people making 100,000 up to a million. And then a larger increase for people above a million because the rules we've set in our society are redistributing incomes up. Our national myth is that we have this socialism policy that redistributes down. The reality of the data is that we are redistributing up and that we don't have trickle-down economics. Remember, that was the rap on Mr. Reagan. We have Amazon up. Well, David, but the editors of the paper, they don't seem to find those kinds of things worthy of repetition on the front page. But the horse race aspects of Hillary versus uh, Barack, man, every day. Well, the new things that happen in the election are, are front page news. And the, the, the thing I would focus on, Larry, is uh, except for a handful of people, Peter Gosselin at the Los Angeles Times, who's done some big series, and a few other reporters here and there now and then, why is it that this issue of income redistribution and government taking from the many and giving to the few is, That's the key is not being reported widely? Right. You are not reading about it in many, many, many newspapers around the country. And I th would think it would be one of the major things. You know, when I became a reporter in the 60s in California, um, 
one of the very first lessons I learned was you're supposed to be watchdogging the government. You're supposed to be looking out for the taxpayers. If the politicians want to spend more money, why? What's it for? Why am I going to give up more of my sustenance to the government? If the government needs it, let's hear the case for it. Well, now we have city councils of big cities in the United States where no reporter goes for months at a time to the meetings, where the city budget doesn't get covered at all. Uh, where, where I, I remember reading a story one day in one of the biggest papers in the country about the county budget in the dominant uh, uh, area of marketing for that newspaper, the suburban county. It was this long, and it consisted of the three county commissioners, uh, two of one party and one of the other, yelling at each other over the budget, and it had a single mention of the budget will be X dollars. It didn't tell me how much of my property taxes go up, are they spending more on the sheriff and less on schools, or are they going to fix the potholes? None of the substance was there. And one of the fundamental changes that's taken place yeah. is yeah. more and more coverage of controversies instead of issues. So I have encountered, I don't know how many people who have said to me, written to me, sometimes left me vicious emails about how we have the strongest economy in history. No, we don't. And nobody who knows the numbers would say something like that. But you could easily get that impression even from watching just television news and listening to the president repeatedly tell us what a strong economy we have when it's just not true. David, at lunch you told this story that illustrated <clears throat> the extent to which one of your colleagues found Reagan to be an extraordinarily bright individual. And yet, uh, which is contrary to a widely held belief, and yet, uh, w wouldn't you say that uh, Reagan is fundamentally uh, responsible for a lot of this because true relying on people like Milton Friedman and uh, von Mises and Hayek who were his philosophers and his economists, true he relied on them, true he carried a lot of people along with him, there was a base of support. You know, the leader better it looks behind, if he doesn't find anybody there, he better slow down. Well, he found people there. But this very bright guy, apparently, he is fundamentally responsible for all of this, isn't he? Uh, yes. Uh, Ronald Reagan, whether you love or hate Ronald Reagan, he was a great leader. He really fundamentally changed America. From 1945 to 1980, we had a bipartisan consensus in this country about nurturing and developing the middle class. I mean, this was no, this was no nirvana. There were plenty of fights back and forth. But, but both sides of the aisle agreed that government should be building up the majority of the people to create a better, wealthier society. We had the GI Bill, probably the smartest single thing government's done in modern times. We Can I had, interject something? Yeah. I personally think, and I think I've said this on television, that except for the Emancipation Proclamation, that's the most important single law ever passed in the United States. It's, I, I think it's a very, very important law. And by the way, because my dad was 100% disabled veteran, I went to school because of the GI Bill. Uh, we had the interstate a lot, highway. A lot of people, that could cause a lot of people to regret the bill. Well, <laughs> it never will be. Um, we had the interstate highway system built, although it was uh, built at the urging of the Pentagon so that we could move material around if we had to, uh, had to have productivity for a war. Um, we invested in all sorts of things, basic science, uh, education. We had 30-year mortgages developed. Uh, and Mr. Reagan came along and said, are you better off? Government is the problem and persuaded people who were faced with problems. Remember, we had two oil shocks, 73 and 79. We had long lines at gas stations, or a few cases where we had shootings of people in line oh, yeah, at gas stations, yeah. uh, one or two of those. We had um, uh, uh, inflation that was scaring people at the time. And I don't think Mr. Reagan intended what happened, OK? I think that Mr. Reagan had a clearly defined set of values. But what we got was not conservative. What we got were radical changes that have, I believe, turned out to work to our detriment. But we live in a society where, you know, presidents and candidates for president of both parties are always saying, God bless America, and this is the greatest country ever. And they're not talking about the real facts of what's going on. Child poverty is increased in this country since 1980, even though we have had divorce rates fall. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of young people who don't go to college because they can't afford it. You know, from tax data, the average income of the bottom half of Americans is $15,000 per taxpayer. You know, Even, that's an offense. I heard you say that. Yeah. That's 
an unbelievable. Even experience. if you go, well, it's right out of the IRS tables. Yeah, I mean, but, you, but, but now, now some people say it's unfair to use that because there's income that isn't counted, like Social Security payments, and it's taxpayers, not households. But even if you go to households, cost of going to state college now is about ten thousand dollars. Let me make a point about that, David. Okay. If you go to households, of course it's higher. That's because women are working. Yes. Now God bless God bless them. This is a, a terrific development in American society, although it has its difficulties for children. But the point remains that households are just about breaking even today with what one guy used to do right. 30 years and, ago. And let me, let me, I want to develop that point, Larry. Um, if you go to household income, even at the typical median level, $50,000, how somebody making $50,000 with even two children can't afford $10,000 a year for college for the kids is amazing. And you know, when you and I were, were kids, college was paid for, it was free to us. Society paid for it because they were investing in the future. Now we're putting roadblocks in the way of the most valuable asset we have. We're, we're subsidizing the owners of baseball teams and football teams, which is lots of fun, but it's trivia. And we're doing it in part by cutting money for this. We're subsidizing Tyco and General Electric through the burglar alarm subsidy that I talk about in free lunch while starving our parks and recreation programs. And what do we get in the big cities because we've starved those programs? Youth gangs. There have always been gangs, not like we have today, not the viciousness, not the reach of them, and it's because of government policy. The fundamental effect that's taking place here is that uh, government has changed from focusing on nurturing and developing a stable middle class to these other policies. Now you mentioned two income households. I think it's a wonderful thing that we don't say to women who want to have a career, you can be a school teacher or a flight attendant and that's it. I mean, my wife's uh, uh, the chief executive or president, she would say, of a big charity that's been very successful and very efficient and lowered its costs all the time she's been there. She wouldn't have been able to do that if she were her mother in all likelihood. Uh, and she's been able to fulfill her talents. But lots and lots of women are out there working at jobs that pay minimum wage or $8 an hour. And the result of the falling wage structure in this country is that the average family with children does 1,000 hours more paid labor today than it did back in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. 1,000 hours, that's working essentially half of the year. Mm -hmm. Now, married women with children often have worked throughout history. A Christmas job, a Saturday job, they had what we used to call pin money, uh, but they were not fundamental breadwinners. And there are costs associated with this. We have costs for daycare. And, and by the way, you know, in, in Rochester where I live, we have the best daycare system in all North America and Western Europe. And the difference in cost was this much. We spent a lot of money on daycare, but for this much more, we got a fabulous system so that when I arrived in Rochester, New York in 1993, two-thirds of the entering kindergartners failed a test of, are you ready to go to school? Uh, could you tie your shoes, you know, left from right, you know, the alphabet, things like that. Today, two-thirds pass. Very small expenditure. Why this program hasn't been replicated all across America is beyond me, but it's a good example of where we're not thinking about using government effectively to improve the lot of the people as a whole, which is what Adam Smith said we should be doing. Thank you, David. Thank you. Yeah, good luck with the book and... What can I say? Tragic situation we find ourselves in. Be with us again next time, ladies and gentlemen, for the next installment of Books of Our Time.